The inexplicable deaths of nine hikers at the base of an isolated and remote Russian mountain in 1959 remains one of history's most enduring and unsolved mysteries. But a new hypothesis may well have finally revealed the true circumstances surrounding their tragic demise. Join us this week as we return to Dead Mountain. Many theories have been proposed about what compelled a group of perfectly healthy and experienced young hikers to flee the safety of their tent and run half clothed into the cold barren night, a course of action that would ultimately end their lives. Indeed, so much has been unearthed and written about the incident that when we originally covered it, we had to spread our presentation across two separate episodes. In the unlikely event that you are unfamiliar with the details of the Dyatlov Pass incident, we would strongly recommend that you go back and watch those videos now, before continuing with this one. In brief, the circumstances are that a team of nine students disappeared whilst on a hiking expedition in the Ural Mountains in 1959. They were last seen alive on the afternoon of the 29th of January, before their bodies were located four weeks later, following a huge search and rescue effort. The group's collapsed tent was located halfway up a then unnamed mountain, having apparently been slashed open from the inside. Initially, five bodies were discovered in and around a tree line at a distance of up to a kilometre away from the campsite. All had suffered minor injuries, were lightly dressed, and had apparently died from exposure. The bodies of the remaining four team members were found two months later, buried in a nearby ravine, some of whom had died from catastrophically violent injuries. Theories regarding their demise ranged from the mundane to the extreme. Some suspected that the group had been caught in an avalanche, or that a fight had broken out amongst them. When traces of radiation were discovered on some of the hikers' clothing, more outlandish explanations took hold, from secret Soviet experiments which were covered up by the government, to aliens and even cryptids. It is no surprise that the enigma of Dyatlov Pass has endured for so long, and continues to capture and hold the imagination. It was always our intention to return to the story, if ever new information was revealed, or more compelling theories were put forward. Well it just so happens that more explanations have been put forward, and at least one of them may have finally laid this mystery to rest, once and for all. The most persistent of all possible scenarios, is that the group was surprised sometime in the night by an avalanche. Although roundly debunked and criticised by any investigator worth their salt, it somehow remains a popular explanation, despite evidence to the contrary. Had an avalanche occurred, the tent would have been fully buried under a few feet of snow, rather than just partially buried as it was, and the hikers footprints discovered heading away from camp would have been completely wiped out. Furthermore, the group ended up over a kilometre away from their tent, and it is unlikely that they would have been able to outrun an avalanche over such a distance. This does not, however, rule out the possibility of a snowslide. A snowslide is what occurs in the beginning stages of a full-blown avalanche, as the main ice pack begins to move, but then stabilises again before the runaway chain reaction has a chance to begin. It could be that this is what the Dyatlov group experienced, and in the interests of safety, decided to move off the mountain and seek protection in the tree line down below. It could also be theorised that the group may have heard an avalanche occurring on another peak nearby, the ominous sound being amplified through the mountain passes, and giving the impression that it was much closer than it actually was. The group may well have thought that thousands of tons of snow were bearing down on them, when in fact, they were perfectly safe. However, 
Many doubt that the rather shallow angle of the mountainside was steep enough for an avalanche or even a snowslide to occur, and none of the telltale signs associated with either were found at the time of the search and rescue operation. Even if the group had heard an avalanche on another nearby mountain, would they have left their campsite without even once looking back at the slopes above them? It seems a bit of a stretch. Another relatively new explanation has been proposed regarding the group's stove. It is well known that Igor Dyatlov himself had constructed a small wood burner, complete with a narrow exhaust that led outside of the tent and expelled any smoke. The group regularly used it to boil water, and as an extra heat source in the freezing cold temperatures. The theory goes that on the night of the 1st of February, either the exhaust became blocked or the stove itself caught fire, quickly filling the tent with smoke and causing the group to panic and run away from their only shelter. On the surface, it seems like a plausible explanation, but when scrutinised further, it has many gaping holes. Firstly, when the rescuers discovered the tent, the stove was found still packed away in Igor's backpack. For reasons unknown, it had not even been set up on the night in question, but this perhaps had something to do with the fact that the closest trees were over a kilometre away, so there was a scarcity of firewood to burn. Secondly, even if the stove had been set up and had caught fire, would the Dyatlov group have run off into the freezing cold night without either trying to smother the flames or at least making sure that their only shelter was indeed a total loss before they headed out into certain doom, or without even trying to rescue some of their essential supplies. Add to this that no smoke or fire damage to the tent's canvas was ever recorded in any of the reports, and this hypothesis quickly falls apart. And this seems to be the issue with all theories surrounding the Dyatlov Pass incident. Many seem fairly sound on the surface, but none of them are without their problems. There is always something that seems somewhat contrived or nonsensical, which is also the reason why the mystery still endures to this day, and has attracted all manner of paranormal and supernatural explanations, because the more mundane theories just don't seem to work. We always knew that the cold weather had played a part in how the Dyatlov hikers had died, but how they died was never the real mystery. The mystery was always why they had left their tent, and as it turns out, the weather may have been responsible for this too. In January of 2019, on the 60th anniversary of the incident, two Swedish adventurers, Richard Holmgren and Andreas Liljegren, alongside two experienced local guides, Ekaterina Zimina and Artem Demogorov, set out on an expedition to Holatsikui, in an effort to uncover the truth about exactly what happened to the Dyatlov hikers. It was an undertaking aimed at replicating the exact challenges that the original group had faced. The expedition would hike out to the site during exactly the same time of year as the original Dyatlov group, the week between January and February, equipped with little more than a large tent and the most essential of supplies. What they would discover during the two week trip through some of Russia's most lonely and isolated areas would lead Holmgren to construct a new theory about what had taken place all those years before. It is one of the most grounded and plausible arguments about the Dyatlov deaths to date, and one that bears a striking resemblance to another tragedy that had previously occurred in his native Sweden. In February 1978, a group of hikers set out across the Arnaris Mountains of the Valadal Nature Reserve in central Sweden. Tragically, eight of them would perish in similar circumstances to how their Russian counterparts did 19 years earlier. They too abandoned their camp, with most of them dying from exposure, and with each of their bodies being lacerated with minor injuries. The parallels between the two incidents are so similar in fact, it is almost eerie. Both events would involve nine hikers, seven men and two women in both cases. They both set out at pretty much the same time of year, in similar conditions, and the terrain of the Arnaris Mountains, bold of trees and with smooth, gentle slopes, set against an endless, undulating horizon, looks almost like a mirror image of the passes south of a Torton Mountain in the Urals, where the Dyatlov hikers met their end. 
The reason the Swedish expedition didn't turn into yet another haunting and unsettling mystery is because unlike the Dyatlov event, there was a lone survivor. We are of course excluding Yuri Yudin, as although he did survive the Dyatlov hike due to illness, he was not present at the time the incident itself occurred, and so could not shed any light on how or why his friends perished. The survivor of the Swedish expedition however, was able to give a first hand account of exactly what had taken place, although this was only after he had sufficiently recovered. For the first few weeks at least, whilst he was heavily sedated and largely incoherent, authorities were at a loss as to explain why the rest of his team had died. The group had been well prepared, travelling across a region far less isolated than that in which the Dyatlov Pass victims were found, and they had only been missing for a relatively short period of time. Rescuers found the bodies at intervals leading away from a small, hastily dug ditch, which was stained red with fresh blood. It was clear that whatever fate had befallen them, must have been swift and brutal in its nature, but it would be a while before that fate was fully understood. As it transpired, the party had spent most of the day skiing, and were coming to a point where they would stop to make camp, when the weather conditions swiftly deteriorated. The group was suddenly hit by freezing cold temperatures, as wind speeds drastically increased, forcing the skiers to construct a hasty shelter in an effort to shield themselves from the deadly elements. Despite having been well equipped, they were already exhausted from their exploits earlier in the day. The freezing temperatures created by the relentless winds meant that the beleaguered skiers were quickly incapacitated. The conditions were torturous. Only six of them managed to make it into the shallow trench they had dug in the snow. The other three, including the one who would survive, were left outside for dead. All attempts to fix some form of roof or cover over the trench failed, as the lashing winds ripped and tore away at whatever they tried to utilise. With their hands frozen and bleeding profusely from digging the trench, they were unable to retrieve vital clothing or equipment from their bags, and one by one, they eventually succumbed to the effects of hypothermia. The shelter they had created in order to survive, was instead, slowly becoming their grave. During Holmgren's and Lil Jägren's 2019 expedition to Dyatlov Pass, the anniversary visit would also fall victim to several sudden and violent changes in weather patterns, resulting in low temperatures and short but dangerous periods of extreme conditions. The team would later learn that in the nights immediately after they had left the area, temperatures had rapidly dropped to further 15 degrees centigrade, leading Holmgren to theorise that the Dyatlov hikers may have been killed by the same thing that took the lives of the Swedish skiers almost 20 years later something known as a Katabatic Wind. Katabatic translates from the Greek word katabatikos, meaning descending. It is also known as a gravity wind or a downslope wind. This occurs when air of a higher density is carried down the slopes of a glacial area, rapidly cooling and increasing in intensity as it moves. In most cases, katabatic winds are rather mild, but if the conditions are just right, they can turn into hurricane force onslaughts, which are far more deadly. They are also difficult to predict, as they are localised events often missed on wider forecasts, and do not require any other type of accompanying weather condition in order to form. With this in mind, Holmgren would go on to propose the following scenario. All available evidence suggested that the Dyatlov group had travelled a great distance on the 1st of February, and had not stopped to rest until late in the afternoon. When their tent was eventually located, it was clear that it had been pitched laterally to the ground, as opposed to angled towards the gradient, and had been fastened in place with standing skis, rather than anything heavier or more secure. As the group settled in for the night, the first they would have known about any sudden and unexpected weather event, would have been an immediate onslaught of wind on the canvas of their tent. The murderous conditions would have likely collapsed the shelter, which was also in danger of blowing away in the gale force winds, so instead of wasting time fumbling with the buttoned entrance, which we incorrectly described as zipped in our original videos, they more than likely cut their way out of the tent for the sake of speed, knowing full well that they could repair it later on.
The group would then have used their hands to shovel snow on top of it in an effort to prevent their only shelter from being carried away. In fact, the rescue team found a torch on top of this piled snow, which they believed was used as a beacon, so that the group could find their way back to camp after the storm had abated. They then made their way down the slope to seek shelter in the trees, not knowing how long the conditions would last. The ferocity and strength of the winds may have been substantial enough to pick up loose items on the ground, such as small rocks and foliage, hurling them towards the fleeing hikers. This would account for the minor injuries to the faces and upper bodies of the five members found in the vicinity of the tree line. In any case, the group now found themselves over a kilometre away from their tent, dressed in little more than light clothing, and by this point, their fate had already been sealed. Holmgren points to the fact that three of the bodies, those of Kolmogorova, Slobodin and Dyatlov himself, were found with the snow surrounding them packed in very tight layers. He theorises that this may indicate the three hikers had collapsed out in the open, while still being relentlessly battered by the heavy winds that were descending upon them from above, and had frozen to death where they fell. Working on the assumption that the other members of the group had managed to push on, Holmgren goes on to divide the fate of the last six into two distinct subgroups. He believes that after pausing for a short time under the shelter of the nearby cedar trees, Doroshenka and Krivonoshenka must have taken responsibility for the construction of a fire, whilst the other four hikers set to building two bivouacs after descending into the ravine, which would shelter them until after the unexpected winds had finally subsided. With their unprotected limbs and extremities half frozen by the biting weather conditions, the chances of the two men having been able to build and light a fire would have been minimal, yet both of their bodies were found with significant burns, which indicated they had successfully achieved this goal prior to passing away. It's likely that even with the amount of heat and warmth that the fire was generating, their bodies were already too damaged and paralysed by the cold to ultimately survive. One of Krivonoschenka's knuckles was torn and bloody where he had been biting it in an apparently unsuccessful attempt to stay conscious. Both had suffered head and facial injuries from where they had eventually slumped lifelessly forward into the flames, which they had hoped would be their salvation. In contrast to the futile efforts of the Arnorous victims in 1978, the snow shelters that were constructed by the remaining Dyatlov group members would have provided them with an effective means of waiting out the howling gale that had descended upon them. Rather than simply digging into the first loose snow that they found, they instead descended into the cover of the ravine. They probably would have been unaware of the deaths of their two companions, as they had laboured to hollow out two good-sized bivouacs in the snow. There was no evidence to suggest that they had taken the time or effort to lay a protective carpet of foliage in either construction, and so it is likely that they had all been huddling together inside one of the shelters, trying to seek some immediate respite from the situation, when fate struck them one of the cruelest of blows. In a heartbeat, the bivouac ceiling collapsed under the weight of the tightly packed snow that lay on top of it, crushing and killing the last remaining team members. From the frozen and well-preserved positions of the four hikers when they were recovered, still buried deep under four metres of snow, it was clear that they would have had no time to react to the tragedy that befell them. Zolotoryov was found still holding a pen and paper in his hands, killed before he even had time to write down whatever he had been hoping to commit to posterity. The remains of Kalevatov and Thibaut Brignoy were lying right alongside him, also killed instantly by the crushing pressure of the falling snow. Dubin Yinna's body was found a short distance away from the others, having sustained catastrophic injuries to her chest and ribcage. Holmgren theorises that she must have been leaning halfway into the entrance to the bivouac, possibly in the act of crawling inside when the tragedy had struck. Her entire upper torso was crushed, but her body subsequently slipped back and had been washed by meltwater away from the others, before freezing again. The scenario presented by Holmgren comfortably accounts for the injuries which were found on each of the bodies, their severity dependent upon which group they had been a part of. For the first three, the injuries were relatively light and mainly sustained to the exposed parts of their body, due to the debris from the howling gale. The next two bodies displayed a combination of minor injuries and fire damage, which had occurred after they had expired, 
For the final victims, the sudden and crushing force of the roof collapse caused the worst injuries to be found at the scene. The apparent removal of softer tissues, such as the eyes and tongue, are a natural occurrence during decomposition, especially in water, or may have been the result of limited animal predation. In terms of the minor radioactivity that was detected, the localised nature of it on the clothing of one group member is explained away by their movements around their college campus, rather than anything more sinister. There will of course be commentators who pick faults in the Holmgren hypothesis and seek to push their own theories about what they believe actually took place, but much about this new theory is compelling, accounting for the lack of snow cover on the abandoned tent, which suggests that an avalanche did not actually take place, and also accounting for the instantaneous high pressure injuries sustained by some of the victims, rather than the blunt force trauma that might have been expected. The fact that these arguments are based on observations, carried out in near identical weather conditions, at the exact scene of the tragedy, should add more weight to them. The people involved in the 2019 expedition have displayed a passion and drive to understand the Dyatlov Pass incident above and beyond mere conjecture or speculation. They seek not to shock or provoke with their findings, only to find a much needed understanding and closure for those closely connected to the tragedy. Sadly, with the passage of time and the decision of the Russian government to suppress all of the evidence in the immediate aftermath of the incident, it is unlikely that we'll ever be sure exactly what caused the sad and unnecessary loss of the students. All we can hope is that by sharing their story, we in some way manage to preserve their memory. May they rest in everlasting peace.